Shadowverse. Greetings, I'm Shad, and yes, this is a bit of a different camera angle at the moment because in this video I'm going to be reviewing, giving my thoughts and impressions for the new trailer for Baldur's Gate 3. Specifically, how accurate it is to the authentic medieval aesthetic. Now, you might be thinking it's fantasy, it doesn't need to, need to be, or, you know, actually historically accurate. That's absolutely true, but we'd like it to be realistic and believable, and so several of the same logic parameters should apply, like functional armor. It doesn't need to be accurate armor, but at least functional. And if they're trying to emulate what it looked like historically, and they get it wrong, well, they're trying to emulate it what it was historically, so it's wrong! Still room for artistic embellishments because of fantasy, but also kind of in addition to my thoughts on this, a bit of a reaction as well to the trailer. Because I am a massive Baldur's Gate fan, I mean, that game was just like drugs for me as a kid. Yet, with my love of fantasy and my love of medieval stuff, sometimes they are at odds, okay? And I try and bridge, bring them closer together in more unity, in peace and harmony. It's kind of possible. Uh, so I'm going to be sharing also some thoughts that I really hope Larry and Studios, who are developing Baldur's Gate 3, might take on board. So, you know, tweet them this video. Now, I am over the moon that Larian is making this because, oh gosh, like Divinity Original Sin 2 was one of the best games ever made, okay? And I've already made a whole video sharing why I think it was so darn good. So if there is anyone who can recapture the magic of Baldur's Gate and improve upon it, okay? Because that was kind of one of my criticisms with the top-down strategy kind of RPG thing that people were just trying to kind of redo the thing with just a bit, uh, you know, uh, some bells and whistles here and there. Yeah, not true polish, but Larian, they have actually improved and elevated the genre, and so if they can bring it to Baldur's Gate 3, oh my goodness, I'm excited! Yet even with how good Divinity Original Sin 2 was, the weapons and armor were pretty darn poor, okay? There was a lot of room for improvement, so hopefully you'll do a better job with Baldur's Gate. Now, Obviously, this is a cinematic trailer, so we're not going to see some of the designs in game. And maybe, maybe because there's still time, they're still doing it. Okay, there's still time to do good, do better, and maybe fix some problems that might exist. So we'll see how we go. Ooh! <laughs> it took two seconds for me to pause it, but come back. Let's have a look at this. Okay, we see a city of. Uh, I'm assuming it's Baldur's Gate, and. Uh, it's a, it's a, a crenellated battlement wall, all right? All right, all right? Very interesting. These crenellations better be head height, all right? You know, you know, you know, oh, okay, head height crenellations for... It's not really a castle, but uh, it's medieval castle-like defenses. It looks great, okay, there are some artistic embellishments on the design, but uh, I will say that the, the towers are inset too far to the line of the wall. The whole point of towers is to give the defenders a greater field of fire, which means them sitting further out from the line of the wall that they're connected to. If they're just sitting on them, they, all they give is really elevation. Now, with the gatehouse particularly, okay, see how the towers on the gatehouse are pretty close to the uh, the actual gate itself? That's not good. In, in a proper true castle design, these are flanking towers and they're supposed to be sitting out further in front of the actual gate itself. So this means any attackers, okay, trying to batter down this door, when they come in close to the gate, they are now in between two towers that can just rain down death, just in a V. Death. But they can't really do this with the way that the towers are on this gatehouse right here. Just get a small little bits of detail, okay? Ah, the city is on fire or smoking. <laughs> All right, okay, we see a fantasy sword, we see a guy in medieval-like armor, and we see a bit of a medieval-ish city. So the fantasy sword design is very stock standard, okay, where it has like these little kind of uh, spiky things uh, on the end of the quillens. That, are, that are, like, spikes up are okay. They uh, look, spikes in general add unnecessary weight to swords, and if you look at real historical swords, they're, they're thin, okay? The cross guards are thin, like, compare this cross guard, to you. Can, uh, you probably can't see the other cross guard, but they're thin. Also, if you can hear a baby in the background, that's my one-year-old son. 
You can't do much about it. The city streets, we're seeing a lot of stone buildings. I see corbelling on the buildings. Okay, all right. It's, it's kind of interesting the things that stand out to me at times because the thing that stood out to me are the shutters on the windows. Why do medieval buildings or medieval style buildings have shutters? Well, because oftentimes they didn't have glass covering them. They weren't completely sealed off. Now, if you're rich, you could get glass on them. And if we look at some of the buildings here, we do see glass in some of the buildings. And, and so if they have glass on them, there's no need for shutters. In the bottom window, we, it looks like this. Actually, no, that looks like it's just a dark interior. So if there's no, if there's no glass, shutters, absolutely, because keep them open the day, fresh air coming through at night time, closing them off, keep the heat in, okay? We can't see too much about the armor. I mean, it seems fairly stock standard with some fantasy elements, like uh, they look like sword breaker pauldrons, except being around the neck, they're, fur they're like halfway down the pauldron, sticking out the side for, artistic embellishment. It's kind of like a saw sword breaker pauldrons and without knowing the actual functional reason why they are there because the reason why you have these you know metal extrusions kind of like loops at the edge of the pauldron near the neck is if a strike hits the shoulder and you're with a sword or something like that it might deflect towards the neck and cut and the neck is a really vulnerable area so they added these kind of up parts these are hence why they're called sword breaker pauldrons because they break or prevent a sword strike from hitting someone's neck and so they were added there to stop that seems like yeah that, that looks cool but we're going to add them halfway down the pauldron so if it hits on the inside of these sword breaker you know elements on these pauldrons i'll just go in and hit the neck still which is a good uh, so again they see something with historical armor and then they make a fantasy adaptation without actually understanding the functional reason why they were there in the first place and therefore undermining the functional design that was there in the first place but let's continue Uh, see, see the uh, bit of clothing he's wearing. I've made a whole video dedicated to this bit of clothing, all right? Uh, giving the historical background, the origin of it, and the name, because many people assume what he is wearing is a tabard. It is not a tabard. What is its true name? I'm tempted to say go watch my video because uh, I want you to watch it. But, but there's so much more information in the video, so go watch it. But I'll tell you the name. It's a monastic scapula. That's what he's actually wearing. You don't really have to say, look, because a monastic scapula is different to a devotional scapula historically, but you could just call it a scapula, okay? Larian Studios, okay? If you're watching this video, it's called a scapula, all right? And if you want to know what an actual debate is, watch my video, okay? Because doing the correct names for the correct items of clothing, uh, let's do it, okay? Accuracy, good. Oh, and by the way, the sword is holding, it looks to be some type of long sword, all right? A long sword is not a one-handed sword. Please don't call your one-handed, uh, you know, cruciform, knight-like swords in this game, long swords, that, those aren't. That's an arming sword. One-handed is an arming sword. Two-handed is a long sword. And a great sword is a sword that's like head height. So your great swords in uh, Divinity Original Sin, which are like your uh, standard two-handed swords, that's a good length size for great sword, okay? Because they were they were big. And in actual fact, the one-handed swords you had in Divinity Original Sin, a lot of them were the length of long swords being used in one hand. And you rarely saw like a traditional, authentic one-handed swords in Divinity Original Sin number two. Just some things to improve on, okay? You make great video games. I love your stuff. Weapons and armor. Does he have a bit of a headache? Ooh, ooh, I'm going back, I'm going back, I'm going back. Ooh, let's see, let's see, frame by frame. Close up of the sword here, okay? We see some of the sword dimensions. It's a diamond cross section with some interesting uh, changes, like uh, there's some uh, indents on the blade. Again, fantasy embellishments, but I don't really have a problem there. It looks kind of cool. Um, we see closer up of the armor, we see those sword breaker elements on the pauldrons here. Uh, the uh, scapula is sitting above a breastplate. All right, uh, yeah. That's fine, that's good. And the breastplate looks well built, solid. And uh, we see some of uh, the, you know, background buildings, not too much detail here. And uh, he's, a, he's afraid, he's afraid of something. What's, what's, what's there? I don't, I don't know, we'll, we'll find out. Yeah, a bit of a close up of the city street. Again, standard kind of architectural design. Uh, interesting, look. Um, this is more about like flavor and the uh, aesthetic you're going for because the uh, some of the elements we're seeing here are not gothic. Uh, gothic architecture is more associated with medi with a medieval aesthetic, a medieval theme because of medieval cathedrals. Okay, uh, but what we're seeing here are is some Romanesque elements. Romanesque architecture, of course, existed in the medieval period, but uh, it was brought back in more appeal or prominence in the Renaissance. So it's a bit more Renaissance architecture, which you can. It's fantasy. So you see, it's artistic 
basic elements like this I don't have an issue with, where you can actually take some other elements of similar or close-ish, you know, time periods and mesh them all together, because that's what you can do in fantasy. It's great, I love it. Oh, and going back on the thing that I said about in Divinity Sin Rent number two, how the one-handed swords looked like two-handed long swords being used in one hand, you can do that. I think it would be great if you had an option to use long swords in one hand or two hand. You'll need kind of a strength requirement, but the, the problem with doing that means What's the point of using a one-handed sword if you can just use a long sword one-handed? And then what's the point of using a long sword in two hands if you can just use a great sword, which is larger? You need to add a statistical benefit for doing it. Now, of course, with a long sword in two hands, it's just a fast weapon, much faster. In my opinion, you should, like, I've made a whole video on rogues that uh, you should be allowed to use agility kind of bonuses with a long sword being used in two hands. And perhaps you'd lose that if you use a long sword in one hand, which of course you would because it becomes a heavier weapon as a result. But great swords do more damage, more reach, and they shouldn't have the same speed or versatility that a long sword in two hands should as well. See, these feel like incorporating accurate weapons and armor kind of things, it just makes it more realistic, okay? And it also enhances gameplay mechanics. Back to the video. Um, he, lo he looks a bit under the weather there, and oh, pet peeve, stabbing your sword into the ground, the tip into the ground, I doesn't, they do this in movies, they do this in everything, and it bugs the heck out of me. Now, of course, in the context of this video, he's not feeling too well, okay? He, he might know about proper sword maintenance, but still, stabbing a sword into the ground, oh, makes me, just an easy way to blunt your sword, damage your sword, and in dirt as well, you dirty your sword, you know, you want to keep it clean, you want to keep it oiled, and stuff like that, and so whenever they do it, it's just like, <laughs> like, a true swordsman would never stab his sword into the ground. He knows to keep it in good condition. And we see a flaming fist on his, you know, scapula. Not a tabard, but a flaming fist on it, okay? Heraldry, uh, you know, like identifying marks and stuff. Uh, this is uh, clearly the crest, the sigil of the flaming fist in that classic line. I serve the flaming fist! Is it like a southern accent in the original Baldur's Gate? I, for some reason I remember it in a southern accent. I serve the flaming... Um, I, 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 you obviously know how bad I am at southern accents now. I serve the flaming fist! So clearly the town guard, okay, like that. Uh, interesting. Mm -hmm. I'm actually just doing some casual research on the concept idea of the town guard in the medieval times because there's, as we know, in medieval history, it was never a homogenous whole. There's differences. And turns out, more often than not, for a standard town, they wouldn't have a dedicated guard, all right? But in some cases they would. So look, more research to come on that subject. <laughs> That's some really powerful indigestion. Okay. Oh, oh no. Some, something's growing out of his skin. Oh, it's happening again. It's happening again. This happened to me once before. It wasn't a pleasant experience. Oh no. Oh. oh. This is rather horrific and gruesome. <laughs> it's like it's just gone full on horror. Okay, well, then. Yeah. Mm. Oh, tentacles from the mountain is turning into a mind flayer. My, oh, well, that would obviously make sense because I've seen the logo for Baldur's Gate 3 there thing and it's got a mind flayer as one of their main logo things, so. Mind flayer. Yeah, creepy monster, you know, I mean, I, I tend to, uh, like, there are other monsters that I find to have greater weight to them, like a beholder, like when you see, like, oh, crap's about to get real when you run into a beholder, and look, that's the same with a mind flayer, but I tend to like, like, in terms of evil, magical kind of creatures, like a full-on lich or something like that has always held more Holy crap, this is a good. But you know, I, I think that comes from my background in role playing because I've come across Lich's role playing and they were the yo oh crap moments and that, that kind of nostalgia carries through. Never came across a mind flayer in my classic role playing escapades. If I did, I probably might might have a greater oh crap kind of thing, mind flayer thing. Um, oh yeah, so. Oh, those are nice corbels. Check out those corbels. Of course, this isn't for proper machiculations. I will save the machiculations cry for a more appropriate time, all right? But this is obviously for a balcony of some kind, but still, oh, I love a good corbel. 
And look at that cobbling behind us. Oh, cobbles everywhere. Oh, love it. Uh. Boulders Gate 3. So, there we go. I'm very, very excited for this game. Uh, looking forward to seeing some gameplay as well. And if Iron Studios would like any input on how to properly categorize the weapons and armor and stuff for the game, do a, do a better job. Look, you do a great job, but you can do a better job in this department. I made videos. Like, you can check out uh, how Fantasy uh, does weapons and armor wrong, like classic mistakes. I also got a video doing that, looking at the classic mistakes of armor, okay, as well. Like, full dedicated videos on the subject. See, this is my kind of thing with with uh, Baldur's Gate specifically. Baldur's Gate had a stronger, more authentic medieval kind of feel. There were certainly fantasy elements to it and mis big mistakes that they made. But if you look at the classic candle keep and the Baldur's Gate city layout, there are some very authentic medieval designs. Baldur's Gate has done a really good job. And because of that, to capture the right, the same feel that the original Baldur's Gate games had, I think they need to go for a more authentic medieval aesthetic. Um, now, because this is in contrast to Divinity Original Sin number two, it had a lighter a medieval aesthetic. It's still, of course, a medieval fantasy game, but the weapons and armor were wrong, and the like. The uh, architecture designs were uh, they were very fantasy. There were a couple of odd things here and there. Maybe I'll do a dedicated video on the architecture designs of Divinity Original Sin. I'm not sure how many views I'll get, but if there's interest, I might. And so I really feel again a more authentic medieval design to capture the same feel of the original Baldur's Gate series. So. Let's do that. But seriously, if there's any studio that can do just as the boulders get and do a good job, a proper true successor, it's Larian Studio. So, very excited. And uh, this has just been my thoughts and reactions on the trailer. Thank you for watching. I hope you've enjoyed. And of course, I hope to see you again. So, until that time, farewell.